All right, let's begin. We're going to learn a lot about the Feast of Sukkot, better known as the Feast of Tabernacles throughout the world. The Fall Feast, let's back up and give you just a quick history of the Fall Feast. It breaks down into the last three feasts of the year. You start off with the Spring Feast of the Lord. This is connected prophetically to the first coming of the Messiah. When Yeshua came, he died at the first feast day of the year, which is Pesach, Passover. He was put into the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they would remove all leaven from their house, all sin from their house, as he was removing all sin from the world. Then, during the Feast of First Fruits, he rose from the dead. He rose from the grave during the Feast of First Fruits. See the connections, see the coincidences that are here. And then 50 days later, on the Feast of Shavuot, better known in Greek as Pentecost, the, the, uh, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, came down. It is, these are not days that were just accidental. He did, decided, uh, he, he did not decide to send His Holy Spirit on St. Patrick's Day or April Fool's Day because He doesn't go by our calendar. He goes by His. And so if we as believers in Messiah do not know God's calendar, we are going to, on, uh, sometime during our life, especially during Judgment Day or the Great Tribulation, we are going to be running around with our heads cut off, not even having a clue what is happening, and we will read into the Scriptures things that just simply don't exist. Yeshua cannot come on February 1st. Did you know that? He can't. It's not possible. He can't come on December 25th. God forbid that He would. He can't because it's prophesied in the Bible. And we better learn these things because when it says that no man knows the day or the hour... We need to read the next few verses that says that those who walk in the light will know the time and season of His coming. So if you walk in darkness, then it says you, it, He will come as a thief in the night. But He will not come as a thief in the night for those who walk in the light. And that's what the Scriptures say. So we as believers better start walking in the light and we better even know what the de definition of light is. Light is defined as truth in the Bible, and truth is defined as devar, or the Word of God. We better know it, and we better know it intimately. So that's the first coming. Then we have this long drought where we have no water, no maim. Everybody say maim. Okay, not mine, okay, but maim, and that means water. There's no water that, that comes from the shemaim. Everybody say shemaim. You know what that is? That's heaven. How amazing in Hebrew, see in English you don't catch it, water and heaven, no connection. In Hebrew, it's the same word, it's the same root word. Water comes from heaven. You have two words, Shem and Mayim in the form of heaven. Shem is the name. The name of water. The name that brings water. Yahweh is the name above all names that brings forth water from heaven. And that water is the water of what? The Word. And what is the Word that came down and dwelt among men in John 1, 14? Yeshua. Okay, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. And so the second coming of our Lord is going to be in the fall. Why? Because that's the only feast days left that are unfulfilled. And so it starts off at Tishrei 1, which we are coming and approaching on right now. That is the Feast of Yom Terah or the Feast of Trumpets. Then 10 days after that, you come to Judgment Day, as we call it in the Scriptures, or the Day of Atonement, the one day a year where the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would make sacrifice first for himself and then for all of Israel, and that would be the, the, the sacrifice, not for the nations, but for Israel. Once a year, their sins were forgiven, and that's Tishrei 10, uh, Yom Kippur, the highest holy day of the year. It's a day of fasting. Then we come five days later on a full moon, might you add. On Tishrei 15, it begins Sukkot. This year, it is October 1st. It's a full moon. Why? You're going to learn why it's in the full moon. The sages will say that it's because Yahweh wanted to put the fullness of light into this. So there would be no darkness. There is to be no darkness during this time. Go figure, contrast with Tishrei 1 when the Messiah comes back during the Feast of Trumpets, it is a new moon. It is a dark moon. There is no light in the earth at all. What did the Scriptures say about one of the things that happens when the Messiah comes back? There will be no light. The sun will be darkened. The moon will be turned to blood. And there, it will be a dark and dreary day. Contrast it to the 15th, which will be a bright, brilliant celebration. And that's what we're going to learn about tonight. Sukkot, 
Sukkot in Hebrew is actually plural of the word sukkah. Sukkah is a booth or a tabernacle, a tent, a, a temporary dwelling place. How many like camping? Some of you used to go camping. I've met people that have never been camping in their life. Never forget, a good friend of mine uh, from the, our fellowship last year made it onto our uh, post-promo video of Tabernacles, and he said, uh, this is my first time at Sukkot. Matter of fact, it's my first time camping, period, but I should be okay because I brought my iPod. <laughs> <laughs> that is Sukkot in the, year, in the 21st century. It is also known by the Feast of Ingathering, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, and um, in Hebrew, Sukkot. Let's look at the very first time that Sukkot is used in the Bible. Genesis chapter 33, verse 17 says this, And Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built him, and built him a house and made booths, sukkahs, for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. Okay? And so uh, that's the very first time that the Bible uses the word Sukkot. And so it's giving us an idea of what a booth uh, is. In today's terminology, how many people have ever owned cattle or horses or livestock out there? Any, any of those? Okay, so we would call this a lean-to, okay? So that gives you a good picture of what original Sukkot looked like. It was a lean-to. Let's talk about some facts of Sukkot. Let's get into the, uh, the dry facts, and we're going to build this thing to probably one of the most exciting uh, traditions that is uh, done during the Feast of Sukkot. First of all, it's a seven-day feast with an eighth day that's called the eighth great, or the eighth great day. It's, the, it's a Shabbat. The seventh day and the last day are Holy Sabbath. No matter what day they fall on, whether it's a seventh day or not, it doesn't matter. If the first day of Sukkot and the last day of Sukkot are, ha are high Sabbaths, and they're treated just like a Sabbath. Okay, there is also a concept called Simchat Torah. This is the time of year that the Torah readings finish. They come to a close. This is so significant prophetically. We don't think through some of these things, and we think, oh, it's not a big deal. But what, what is the Torah portions anyway? For those of you that are watching that don't know, a Torah portion is they basically take the first five books of the Bible and divide them up into portions, and each week a certain section of those portions are read until the Torah is completely read, and then it's called Simchat Torah, the ending of the Torah. It's renewed. It starts all over. Okay, and so go figure that Simchat Torah ends, comes to an end, and comes to fruition, I should say, during the feast of Sukkot, the very last festival of the year. Do you think that's a coincidence, or do you think there might be a hidden thing on God's calendar telling us that he's trying to tell us something, something's going to be renewed, something's going to happen. We're going to go back. By the way, for all of you Bible scholars out here, what is, when you end the Torah and you go back to the beginning, where are you going? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1. isn't that incredible? All you Torah scholars, give yourself a round of applause for paying attention. What is the very first verse of Genesis? Anybody know? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What do you think is going to happen at the last Sukkot, at Simchat Torah, in a prophetic spiritual sense? He's going to create a new heavens and earth. See how that works? The Bible starts all over. It's really amazing. If you take time to go through some of these things, we'll be able to see these. You're going to see a lot of amazing connections here this evening. By the way, also, it's the origin of Thanksgiving. Did you know that? That's where Thanksgiving came from, was the Feast of Sukkot. It's the biggest feast of the year. Uh, when, when, uh, uh, how many know who Christopher Columbus is? How many know he was Jewish? How many know that in 1492... There was something that happened besides the discovery of America. What was it? The Spanish Inquisition, where the Jewish people were kicked out of Spain. Guess his grandfather uh, was, was, uh, was very, very Jewish. And so as he fled, uh, the, uh, the, as the Spanish Inquisition was going on, that was part of the reason why he came and he did not know he was going to discover the new world. And so when he came and the Puritans and all of them, a lot of their, their traditions wrap right around these Hebrew holidays. And this is where Thanksgiving originated. This is why it's the biggest feast of the year. This is why on Thanksgiving we all gain 10 pounds. 
This is why when you come to Sukkot, you will gain 10 pounds because uh, it's a lot of feasting. It's not called the Great Feast for nothing. And that's exactly what it's called. It begins five days after Yom Kippur on the 15th day of Tishrei. It's a drastic change from the most solemn day of the year, five days earlier, Yom Kippur, where there is a solemn assembly. There is a lot of, uh, uh, of fasting and praying. There's kind of almost a, a soft, sad countenance because this is judgment day for all of your friends and loved ones someday in the future after the great wrath of God and when he has taken his people up on Tishrei 1, the great wrath of God comes for those 10 days, destroys the people of the earth, and, uh, and, the, and then judgment day happens right there uh, at Yom Kippur. So that goes behind, and now we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb, if you will, where there is great celebration. The word sukkah means booth and refers to temporary dwellings that the Israelites used to commemorate the leaving of Egypt and having no permanent homes. This is why during the Feast of Sukkot, we encourage people to, to do the best that they can to honor Su uh, Sukkot. Either go camping for a week, uh, like we do, and go in your temporary dwelling places, whether that be a pop-up camper, or whether it be a, a makeshift lean-to. I know there are people that that to really get the full feel of Sukkot, they will just simply take a tarp and, and, and put it over a limb of a tree and sleep under it. I'm not one of those. <laughs> I'm going tent camping this year. Uh, for the first time, I was a camper uh, tenter for years. When you have multiple kids, it makes a difference. Uh, but in any case, we want to be temporary, and that's one of the things you can do. Some people do it in their very backyard. You're going to see some pictures here in Israel of what they do, and uh, it might shock you how big of a deal uh, this is. Uh, Israel is flooded with millions of people, just like it was years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, during the time of our Messiah. The first day was to be a Sabbath as well as the eighth day, according to Leviticus 23:39. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It commemorates the building of the first tabernacle in the wilderness that temporarily housed the spirit of the living God. When they left Egypt, they did not have homes. So the only homes that they had were what they brought with them. And so at the same time, what's amazing, folks, let me, let me throw this out. Yeshua says he came and he dwelt among us, right? Did you know that was not the first time? Yeshua doesn't make up anything. Jesus didn't just make up things. He just didn't do things for the first time. It is a pattern. All he does is copy what happens in the Torah because he is the word of God. So when was the first time that God came? It says that God did not have a home. He did not have a dwelling place. Now, are you telling me that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who is infinite and in every direction, far bigger than to sit on a metaphorical throne, that he actually didn't have a home? What, what's he talking about there? He certainly had a home, but he didn't have one here. So he asked his people to build, to take offerings, to take their tithes and offerings, take everything that they could possibly do, and build him a temporary dwelling place until the real temple could be built. You. You see, the first time that, 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 the, that the divinity came to earth, see, we're so used to, to Yahweh coming and filling Yeshua, and, and that being the story of God coming to earth and, 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 and paying for the sin of mankind and dwelling among us, right? We're so used to that. But wait a minute, he already did it once. He did it in the wilderness where he came and dwelt among his people temporarily. Even when Yeshua came, it was temporary. He was the living Mishkan, the living tabernacle. This is why John is not just, he's not using metaphors, he's not just a stroke of genius. He's, when he says that he came and tabernacled among us, he was referring to words that had great meaning in first century Jewish culture. Great meaning. And if you use the word tabernacle or Sukkot in the first century, every Jewish boy and girl and man, woman and child knows exactly what you're referring to. The Feast of Sukkot. This was the seventh feast. If you don't think this is prophetic, check this out. It was the seventh feast of the year. It occurred during the seventh month, which would have been during the seventh full moon of the year, and it was to be celebrated for seven days. Technically, it is a, only a seven-day feast with an extra day added that is a separate 
technically a separate feast day. Why is it separate? Because every day of the feast is connected to a thousand years of time. The feast of Sukkot, it encompasses the entire timeline from Adam to the time that the new heavens and the new earth will be made at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. This is that feast. It is a feast of all the nations and for all of time. He doesn't just throw out and say, man, I'm going to go with my favorite number. We're going to do it for seven days. No, he chooses seven days because there are seven millenniums of time. And he must separate the eighth great day because the eighth great day is the eighth millennium when the heavens and earth are completely wiped away. He starts completely over with a new heavens and new earth and nobody knows what that day is going to look like. All of these are just prophetic on his calendar so that we could dig deeper and find out more about ourselves and more about the days to come so that we can draw closer to him. This feast day is about drawing closer to him because what happens right before the Feast of Tabernacles is the month of Elul that I just taught on. It's all about teshuva. It's all about repenting, returning, coming back to the Messiah, preparing to meet your bridegroom as the bride, spotless with no wrinkle. So when we do that, what happens is that we are preparing for the seventh day. And I'll talk about what happens on the seventh day here in a little bit. Did you know that there are 70 bulls that are sacrificed during the Feast of Sukkot? Do you think that it's just a happenstance that God just says, I'm extra hungry on that day, I want you to give me 70 bulls? Or would you think that it's not barbaric, that Yahweh has an absolute plan there's purpose in everything that he does, just sometimes we don't understand it. Did you know that in Genesis chapter 10, the Bible tells us there are 70 nations of the world? The Feast of Sukkot at the end of time is a sacrifice, one bull for each nation of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, if the, if the Arab world and if the world that hates Israel in ancient times knew that the Feast of Sukkot was all about saving their backsides. They would send every one of their armies to surround the Jerusalem wall to protect it. They wouldn't be trying to destroy it and tear it down because they don't understand that every one of those bulls is for them. It's for their forgiveness. It's for their repentance. They're saying, in a sense, we love the nations. This is a celebration that we know that God is going to bring the world to repentance the best that he can, and we need to help prepare the world. The world doesn't even have a clue. No different than the world doesn't have a clue from most of us what we do here. Even most of the, of the Christian religion has never even heard that God has a calendar, much less even the name of the Messiah is Yeshua. If we only knew some of these things, it's no wonder that we call this the age of grace because we definitely are in it, amen? And I need it all day long. It's celebrated after the harvest and after the grapes have been pressed into wine. Let me talk about this for just a second. So, and I've mentioned this multiple times, but on the prophetic timeline or the prophecy timeline, the Messiah comes during the Feast of, of Trumpets, during the dark moon. Those two to two and a half days that the moon is dark. We don't know exactly which day, but we're going to know, this, know the season. Then there is 10 days of all. During that time, first of all, the, the, the saints are caught up in what is called the rapture. Where, we're, where the dead in Christ rise at the sound of the trumpet. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them, as you know the Scriptures very well. Then the wrath of God comes on the earth for those ten days, called the ten days of all. That is the time that coincides, believe it or not, with the making of wine, where they take the grapes, grapes and they press them with their feet. Did you know that grapes are not pressed with stones. Grapes are pressed with feet. Do you think that that's coincidence? Olives are pressed with stones, but 
grapes are pressed with feet. What does the prophecy say about Yeshua at the end of time? What is he going to do? He's going to press his enemies and the earth is going to be his what? Footstool. Do you think that that's coincidence? He literally is going to press his enemies with his own feet because stones represent men. His feet will be the only ones that will press his enemies. Stones will not be involved. You will be gone. It will only be his stone, the stone that the builders rejected, has become the chief corner stone. And in Hebrew, that stone, that word can be aben as well, the sun. The sun, the main corner stone, will be the one with his feet that will press his enemies. And that will be, that's connected, by the way, to the battle of Armageddon and the river of blood. That is the wine press. So after the harvest, that's you, and after the wine press, the wrath of God, comes the celebration. Sukkot speaks of life in its very simplicity. How many know in America, we are bombarded with the idea that keeping up with the Joneses. We got to build a bigger house and do better things and have nicer cars and do this. And everything gets so complex. Every time they come out with a new operating system or computer program, it makes life more difficult. It's one more thing you got to do. It's one more thing you have to install, which is one more reason to get another virus out of your, your computer. Sometimes it's worth it to put your phone down. Sometimes it's worth it to turn your computers off. You will survive. Sukkot is, is that reminder that Yahweh does not dwell in big houses in complexity. He speaks to the humble, the contrite, and to those that are in simplicity. It reminds us that Yahweh God is our shelter and He's a sustainer of life at all difficult times. And the Israelites had very difficult times for 40 years. And it's also connected to the wedding ceremony under the chuppah. Because that's what a chuppah is. A chuppah is really a glorified sukkah. And that's what it looks like. There have been people in this congregation that have been married under a chuppah right here. Why do we do it? Is it a Jewish thing? They're the only ones that do it. But does that make it Jewish? What if it was the Arabs that did it? Would we call it Arab? Muslim? Or do we only title things because a certain group of people do it? So let me ask you a question. Are certain things Christian or are they biblical? I don't want them to be called Christian because Christian means anything today. Pretty much. If you have the word God attached to it, it's Christian. I want it to be biblical. And a chuppah is so, I totally understand why they want to get married under a chuppah. Because under a chuppah is under the presence and the shelter of the living God during the festival of Sukkot when everything has been gone, the past is over, and everything is brand new. It's a celebration. And that symbol symbolizes the greatest celebration at the coming of the Messiah when we will feast with Him under His banner over me is love. Amen. Come on. In biblical times, Sukkot was considered the most important of all the holidays and it simply was referred to as the great feast. In 1 Kings 12, 32. I cannot emphasize or overemphasize enough. This was the most unbelievable party of, of all the year. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 says this, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. I've said this a hundred times here at PFT over the last decade, but I'll say it again because there's so many new people that, that, that watch these, these online and even maybe in here in the audience today, that the word season there has nothing to do with, with, uh, with spring and summer and winter and fall. In the garden, ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you there was no winter coats. That word season in Hebrew is moedim. That word moedim means appointed feast day. It's an appointed time. It's the time when Yahweh says, now is the time that I want to meet with you. This is my calendar blueprint. 
the sun, moon, stars I put in place so you'll know when to meet with me. Otherwise, you can't get in trouble. If you, if you know when you're supposed to meet, then you, you will never miss that meeting. No different than if you are married and you have an anniversary, you don't want to miss it. There might be consequences, like the Great Tribulation. <laughs> appointed time, feast day, congregation, assembly, they're Yahweh's appointed anniversaries. And I don't know about you, but you can call it legalistic. That's like a husband telling his wife, wow, I can't, we don't, we, it's legalistic to celebrate your, our, your anniversary or your birthday on the same day every year. <laughs> Try that and see how long you last indoors. I want to honor Abba's anniversaries, don't you? Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, just in case you think they might be Jewish. Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the feast of Yahweh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are not Jewish, they're my feasts. No man can take credit for these feasts because they're his calendar, his anniversaries. We are invited, just like if I have a birthday party and I invite you, it's not your birthday party. You are invited to a birthday party. You are invited to an anniversary party. You are invited to a wedding reception. It's the same thing. Abba says, these are my feasts, and I give them to my people. So it depends on whether you define yourself as his people, whether or not you can take part in his feasts. And I don't know about you, but just the word feast gets me excited to want to be a part of it. Especially in the middle of a 21-day cleanse. I can tell you that much right now. Leviticus 23, 40. Let's talk about this and read the actual scriptures. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. This is what they look like today. Uh, this is called the lulav and the etrog, okay? And the point and purpose of them is this. They're gathering types of trees from the four corners of Israel, representing the four corners of the earth. What do trees represent? People. So what this is an amazing tradition. Now, it looks a little strange if you come to Sukkot or go to any Sukkot that does this and and it looks like a bunch of Indians running around uh, waving these etrogs and these lulavs, right? And pointing to the north and the south and the east and the west. And if you were a local television camera that showed up, it would be for sure labeled a cult. <laughs> but if you knew the prophetic significance that in the first century you have millions of people, millions of people with bows in their, in their hands and etrogs and they're waving and it represents that at the end of time, remember those 70 nations, that Yahweh is going to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth, the trees that represent people and even though we don't know who these people are, we are going to dance and celebrate with them even now and by the way, there will be fruit because it's harvest season and Yahweh will harvest his fruit from the earth. How cool is that? Every tradition in the Bible has an awesome meaning that is prophetic and significant. We should not snub our nose at the front of the book, ladies and gentlemen. The back of the book was written upon it. These are some sukkahs in Jerusalem today. People build them right off their balconies. Here's one here in Japan. See, you take on the flavor of your local uh, community little bamboo there. Here's one in a cornfield <laughs> made from corn stalks. It's just a temporary dwelling place. You make it however you want. You put a, you're supposed to eat in there. You're supposed to sleep in there. There's some more right in Israel. See young boys going by and playing. There are companies in Israel that make these as kits and people buy them and, and it's amazing. It's the biggest celebration of the year. You'll see this all over the place in Israel. There's a family sitting under their own family sukkah in their backyard. It's an intimate time of prayer. You do worship, Bible study. It's a time where families are commanded to be together. Parents, wouldn't you love it when you have teenagers if you could, if you could point to a verse in the Bible that commands them to eat, eat dinner as a family? This is it, seven days straight. 
This is our personal sukkah. One of the pictures from our past sukkahs here at Passion for Truth. Always an interesting event, putting up the annual sukkah. And how about this? One of the most um, uh, interesting times of the year, the interesting temporary dwelling places of all the times of the year that Yeshua the Messiah could have came to this earth. This was the time. He was not born during December 25th. As most of you know, December 25th, we get that, that date from because every single sun god in every culture of all times on the whole timeline was born during December 20th, on December 25th. And so the pagans took our Yeshua, our Jesus, our Christ, made him the son of God as the Romans that worship the sun god took in another god, Jesus. They compromised and they made his birthday on the same day as all the pagan sun gods they've been worshiping for years. And here our Lord, our Messiah, got cheated out of the most incredible feast day and birthday of all time. Because he was born at Sukkot. How do we know that? It's very simple. John the Baptist was born how many months before Jesus? Six. His father was Zechariah who served in the temple. There are 24 courses to the temple. Zechariah was the eighth course. We know exactly, based on history, what date the eighth course served in the temple. They served twice a year. And the Bible says that when he came back from his course, guess what? He missed his wife. And shortly thereafter, John the Baptist, or John the Immerser, was, uh, was conceived. Nine months after that, lands right on what? Passover. He was preparing the way of the Lord for Yeshua to die on Passover. He was born on Passover. So if you go six months from Passover, guess what? You land right in the middle of Sukkot. So our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, was born during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is why John said he tabernacled with men. What's so incredible is the birth of salvation came to the world. That's saying it in English. Let me say it in Hebrew. The birth of Yeshua came to the world because Yeshua means salvation, if you don't know that. There can be no other time of the most greatest celebration in the world at that time was to be born during Sukkot was a very special time. Why do you think Mary and Joseph were coming to their hometown anyway? Because everyone's required to come up. This is a commanded, one of the three pilgrimage feasts of the, of the year, the fall feast, to come to Jerusalem. So if you are in a government leader at that time, that's a good time to take a census, isn't it? And secondly, or thirdly, or whatever number I'm on, the shepherds are in the fields. They're not in the fields in, in, in the middle of winter. They bring all of their cattle in in October, right after the Feast of Sukkot. Amen? Awesome. Psalm 118 is read during this feast. It's represented by light and rain. And if you'll humor me for just a minute, I'm going to read Psalm 118. It's very short. And I want to stop on a, ve a very incredible verse that some of you have probably never read before. Psalm 118, that's a long, long book here. Psalm 118. Do you know what the middle chapter of the Bible is? What's the longest chapter of the Bible? Psalm 119. Do you know what the, the, uh, the middle verse of the Bible is? Watch this. Let's read it together. Psalm 118, verse 1. Give thanks to Yahweh. This is all about Sukkot. For he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let the house of Aaron say, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear Yahweh say, his loving kindness is everlasting. They sang this, by the way. It would be a beautiful song. From my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Yahweh is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Sound familiar? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. And this is the middle verse of your Bible. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in man. 
This whole chapter is about the Feast of Sukkot and getting in the temporary dwelling place. It's a strong tower, and the righteous run into it. Now, wait a minute, time out. Strong tower, it's a lean-to. Look with your eyes closed, and you will see the temple of the Lord your God. And the righteous see the lowly, and they, they, they see beyond the sticks, and they see stones of the living God, and they run into it. And if you trust in His refuge, it's better than trusting in man. I'll continue to read. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. End of time. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of Yahweh, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished as fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but Yahweh helped me. The Lord is my strength and song. He's become my Yeshua. He's become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and Yeshua is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die, but live. I entail the works of Yahweh. And Yahweh has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. This is all about the great tribulation. Disciplining his people. And it goes on and it ends by saying this. Bind the festival sacrifice, in verse 27, with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness lasts forever. This is the last chapter that's read during the feast of Sukkot. The very last verse of the, of the then known world and the very last verse of this world will be read and it will be said give thanks to Yahweh for he is tov he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting and bam we ended the marriage supper of the lamb Mark chapter 9 verse 2 now after six days, Yeshua took Peter, James, and John, led them up on the high mountain apart from themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three su sukkahs, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What time of year was it? He wouldn't have said, let's make three sukkahs if, if it was not the Feast of Sukkot. And go figure, he's not going to show up on July 4th, even though I think it would be cool. There'd be fireworks. <laughs> he shows up on the most important holiday of the year. How many have heard that song that says, it is done, it is finished, to Telestai? This is it. Him coming back is like him saying, during the Feast of Sukkot, it is finished. The celebrations, let them begin. The doors are shut to the ark. This is from Hebrew Christian, HebrewForChristians.com. I thought this was a fantastic quote. It says, The miracle is the sheltering presence of God, not the booths themselves. The sukkah, therefore, functions as a sign that God loves us, that he delights in our well-being, and that he tenderly protects us from hardship. Were it not for God's constant care, we would perish in the wilderness of this world. So let's go into the scriptures of the command. It says, Leviticus 23, 38, Besides the Sabbath of the Lord... Besides your gifts and besides all your vows, besides all your free will offerings which he gives unto the Lord, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day you shall have a Sabbath, and on the eighth day you shall have a Sabbath. Now, if I, this is the first time that I'm hearing this, I'm a bit confused. Because he just said you should have it for seven days. On the first day you have a Sabbath, and on the eighth day you have a Sabbath. Anybody would agree? That's kind of confusing. But as we talked about before, there's a reason for it. You shall take with you on the first day boughs of goodly trees, branches, and, and take them and, and wave them before your God every single day. And you shall keep it as a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute until my son comes. And then I don't want you celebrating it ever again. Some of you are awake. It says you shall be a statute forever. 
in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Are you an Israelite born? Or are you grafted in? You only get two choices. Jeremiah 31, 31. Just in case, to catch everyone up, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. There is no house of the Gentiles. You must be in one of these two. If you're not sure exactly what I'm talking about, please uh, watch the teaching that I have called Identity Crisis, and it will open up your mind to seeing all of this from a completely different perspective. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, but a new covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law, the Hebrew is Torah, I will put my Torah, which means instructions, in their inward parts, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Deuteronomy 16, 16 says this, three times a year all the males appear before Yahweh, thy God, in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, which is Pentecost, and in the feast of Sukkot, and they shall not appear before me empty-handed. He, he, listen, would you dare to go to a baby shower without bringing a gift? At the very least, a diaper. Would you, would you not go to a wedding and bring a gift? We go to birthday parties and bring a gift. You should not come before the Lord your God, I'm talking uh, 3,000 years ago here, empty-handed. You give gifts to those that are important, to those that you support, to those that you, you love and you want to be a part of their lives. You say thank you. That's what gifts are for. In the millennium, for those that believe that the Feast of Sukkot is done away with, folks, it can't be. The Bible, even Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, that until everything is fulfilled, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the Torah. We know for a fact that the fall feast days have not been fulfilled. So we know for sure, for a fact, that Sukkot, Yom Kippur, and Yom Terah have not been fulfilled. We need to be able to honor them even now because why? In the millennium, we're going to have to do it. It says right here, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left on the nations after the battle of Armageddon, which shall come against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh Sebaot, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. It shall be to those who will not come up from all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even to them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague. The family of Egypt meaning those that are not of God's people. Going all the way back metaphorically the time of Egypt and the Exodus. Wherein the Lord will smite the heathen that come not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, that the punishment of the nations that come up that do not keep the Feast of Sukkot. How many times did he have to say that in the Feast of Sukkot during the millennium? We need to learn these things and what they're all about so we'll appreciate it when we get there. Deuteronomy 16, 17, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you. You see, God does not expect more than he gave you. The only thing he expects is that you give to him as he gave to you. Exodus 25, 1 is the very first Sukkot. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And in 2 Chronicles 1, verse uh, 1 through 3, it says, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled themselves together in the, unto the king in the feast which was in the seventh month. Do you think it's coincidence that Solomon's temple was finished during the feast of Sukkot? And it was dedicated at this feast. The feast that's in the seventh month. There's only one feast in the seventh month called the Great Feast, and it's the Feast of Sukkot, where you dine with the king. There will be a third temple set up according to prophecy, and when that temple is set up, when Yeshua comes back, he sets up the temple, he lights the temple from within, and then we are invited to the coronation service of the king, the marriage supper of the Lamb.
Revelation 21.3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and he will be... Listen, if Yeshua himself, according to our scriptures, is called a sukkah, we better learn what a sukkah is. Hello? If it's that important and so significant that the Apostle John would say that he tabernacled among us, if it's so important that he was born during the Feast of Sukkot, if it's so important that he is called himself the tabernacle of God that dwells with men, that we should come in and be his people, we better learn God's calendar. We better learn his feast days because to learn his feast days is to learn of him and to draw closer to him. I don't want to be out in the rain. I want to be under the sukkah. Second Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5.1 says, For this we know that our earthly house, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, see the, see the terminology that he's using? We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. See how much it's in the mind and the sight of the disciples. That we are all temporary dwelling places. Why do you think they shared with one another? There was real mishpacha, real community. No one was stingy. They pulled their, their wallets out and they handed money to one another like there was, they didn't even question it because if the person was taking advantage of them, it's not their problem. They're getting judged on judgment day because they're given to Yahweh, not to that man. Now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, we need to get back to the, the eyesight and the mindset of the disciples that understood that we're just temporary dwelling places. When we understand that everything's temporary, then we get everything in eternal perspective. Now, drum roll please for, the, for the, fi- the finality, the fireworks of this teaching this evening, which is the fireworks of the Sukkot all seven days ends with the, the water libation celebration or ceremony. Most of you probably never heard of this, but this is the most exciting part of Sukkot and is the most prophetic part as well. And I believe it will impact you greatly. The water libation celebration, let me give you a little background. Water in the scriptures is Mayim, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Water comes from heaven. The Israelites did not exist without Mayim. Water was what caused the ground to swell around the seeds and give them the word of Yahweh, because the word of Yahweh is the only thing that causes anything to be creative. And it burst forth through the ground only because of water. What came forth with the ground was wheat. Wheat makes into bread and it sustains life. This is why Yeshua calls himself the Lechem and why he was born in Beit Lechem, the house of bread, Bethlehem. He's the bread of life. Any man that eats of me will live. In the Israelite culture, they understood that. You can't live without bread and you can't have bread without what? Water. So every day during the Feast of Sukkot, because they just had the giant harvest festival, now it's a time to celebrate. They got a bunch of food on their hands, and they got a bunch of money in their pockets because they save up all year for this. To thank the Father for what He's already going to do next year, they're thanking Him for rain. So what do they do? They pour out water in this daily ceremony culminating on the seventh day, the great day. And they pour water out on the altar every single day. Strange tradition. Back in the, in, in the first century, the, the, the Sadducees were pretty much in charge. And, uh, and then you had the Pharisees. Yeshua was probably closer to a Pharisee. He was very similar to a Republican and Democrat. Not saying Yeshua was a Republican either, okay? So no emails. But very conservative were the Pharisees, believe it or not, on most things. And the Sadducees were very uh, liberal and, and, and very strict in other ways. They did not believe in the oral traditions uh, of the Torah like the Pharisees. And so, so the, Pharisees, the Sadducees didn't like this, this ceremony that the, uh, that the rest of Israel really liked. So the Pharisees said, you know what? We're not really in charge. Uh, our party's not in charge right now, but we're going to make a big deal about this because we're going to basically shove this in the face of the Sadducees and show them how sad they are, you see. And we are going to radically make this a giant celebration. So I cannot overemphasize it. Tabernacles, as I already said, was a giant celebration. This was the grand finale of the celebration was the water libation ceremony. What they did with this water libation ceremony is the July 4th, 
okay, is to America. The Temple Institute says this over in Jerusalem. In fact, this joy was so immense and the celebration so uplifting that the sages of Israel emphatically stated, whoever has never seen the celebrations of the festival of the water libation has never experienced true joy in this life. That's saying something. I remember when my firstborn daughter was born. When she was born, I cried and laughed at the same time. I never had that kind of flood of emotions. That was joy like I've never experienced outside of my wedding day. And it says that joy you've never seen until you've seen the water libation. I think you're going to understand a little bit as we move through here. This is a good picture of what it was like. This is in what's called the court of the women. It's a little bit misleading. It's not really a court of, of women. It's all the men are down there uh, on the main floor and they would raise up uh, these uh, giant basically stadium seating around the whole entire court uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the temple and all the women would watch from above. And the reason for that is, is because even they understood that if you get men and women uh, in a big celebration dancing together uh, and, and with a bunch of wine, that's probably not a good scenario for something to happen later that evening and things to get out of control. So they figured that out years ahead and they separated them and it was two giant parties that went on at the same time. If you look very careful, you'll see this, uh, this post. You see that post right in the middle of the picture? And then there are four uh, uh, like bowls of oil, okay? And each one of those bowls are, have five gallons of olive oil in there. Five gallons of olive oil there. That is a giant spotlight. It is a giant lantern, if you will. Matter of fact, they said that these, uh, even the wicks that they made from these lights were made from old and worn clothing of the priests. The lamps towered over the court and shone forth with such a light so bright that there was not a single courtyard in all of Jerusalem that, didn't, that was not illuminated by the light of the festival of the water libation ceremony. It was so bright it would cast a shadow on every single courtyard in Jerusalem. That is one giant party. Boys would climb up there with ladders to the very top and they would take the, 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 the oil and they would pour it in there and that was the beginning of the party. Every single part of this is prophetic, ladies and gentlemen, every part. How many bowls did I say there were? Four. How many, did, how many poles held up that? One. One pole for four. Remember that. What were the wicks made out of? The priestly garments, okay? Let's go to John chapter 19, verse 23. It says, And the soldiers, when they had crucified Yeshua, took his garments and made how many? Four parts to every soldier apart and his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Do you think that was just happenstance that the soldiers split it into four parts? Do you think it's happenstance because Yeshua is the high priest, ladies and gentlemen? There is no pure linen than the high priestly garment. And it was torn into four wicks, if you will. This is why Yeshua is called the light of the world. Did you know that the water libation ceremony, that that light was called the light of the world? Hello! It is lighting the entire tabernacle. What, is Yeshua's, what does the scripture say happens when Yeshua comes back? He will be the light of the world and he will light the temple from the inside. What do you think he's talking about? This light that they erected, one pole from one root, one tree, holding the four wicks, the four parts of his garment for the how many parts of the world? The four corners of the world. Each wick was for one corner of the world. And he's a constant, constant reminder that my sheep have been scattered into the four corners of the world. And if they will turn toward the covenant of the east, they will see the lamp that I made for them. And they will know how to return. Hallelujah. I don't know if you don't get excited from this message. I don't know what's going to do for you because I've just begun. I only got two hours left. The Jerusalem Talmud says this, historical writing of the Jews says, herein lies the true secret of the festival of the water libation ceremony. The great joy was in the receiving of prophetic inspiration. Time out, stop, 
put the record backwards, prophetic inspiration. Wait a minute, this is before the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes down and gives the feast, you know, all of these spiritual gifts that we have today. Prophetic inspiration? It goes on to read in the history books that they did this for one simple reason. They weren't asking God to send rain. They believed prophetically that he already did. That he already was going to send it. There was no doubt in their mind. The celebration was that it was already done. This was not a Father, please send rain. This was, Father, thank you for the rain that when we close our eyes, we already see. and We open our eyes, it's desert. But when we close our eyes, we see the, the Shamaim, the heavens and the water come out of the heaven. Your word come down and bring light into this world. Thank you, Father, for the rain to come so that there'll be a great harvest next year. Lord, ladies and gentlemen, you know what that's called in the Bible? Faith. Before we say there was faith. Here's how it began. They would go down to the pool of Siloam. They had about a half a liter golden flask. And they would dip it in the pool of Siloam. Or you might be familiar with the pool of, of Siloam. This pool has been found in Jerusalem. I've been there. I've sat on the steps. It's absolutely breathtaking. In the exact place, I stood within a probably a 10-yard place of where Yeshua would have reached down and grabbed the mud, spit on his face, spit on, on, his, on his fingers, and put it on the blind man and healed his eyes. Right here. That's the pool we're talking about. This is the pool that, that, that God's people were required to go down into to mikvah and they would come out on the other side. If they wanted to climb the Ophel, if they wanted to go to the, the, the house of God and climb the stairs of the temple, they had to go through this pool. You had to be mikvah. You had to be immersed. This is the concept of what we call baptism. You must be baptized into the blood of Messiah. You must have his water of his word come over the top of you. And when you do, when they come out on the other side, they would be given a white robe. Go figure. It was almost as if they read the book of Revelation. Because that's what happens in, at, at the end of time. When Messiah comes back, what do you get? You get a white robe. Why? Because you were just mikvahed. Now you're going to climb to the hill. So they would grab the water in that half liter container. Giant festival. People, shofars, the top instruments and vocalists in all of Israel were present for this ceremony. This is not the B team, the C team, or the upcoming apprentices of the young people. This is the experienced musicians, the top of the top, the best of the best. This is the Olympic team. All of Israel is, is around them, and they got this unbelievable worship team that is, is, is doing this water libation ceremony. It's at the base of, of, of Mount Moriah. Then they climb the hill of the Lord, and they go through, go figure, what's called the water gate. They go through the water gate, and everyone's excited. Everyone is, is yelling and screaming. They're singing Hoshana, Hoshana, save us, the Lord God in the highest. And then they would take that and they would pour it out on the altar. Now see, you always know a Canaanite altar versus a Hebrew altar because Hebrew altars had a ramp and a Canaanite altar had stairs, okay? And, and, uh, and that's always the difference is they did not want even their ankles to show and show their nakedness because their nakedness, even their skin represents uh, only uh, represents sin. So they would only show the skin that God said that he wanted to see. And do you know what skin he wanted to see? The panim. Do you know what panim means in Hebrew? Your face. Everybody look to your left. Look at your neighbor's face or your right, whichever your neighbor's facing on. Some of you are confused. Okay, you see their face. What is it? It's a face. Did you know in Hebrew that's not what it means? What you see, if I say describe your neighbor's face, you're going to say, okay, little pudgy, round, glasses, whatever, no hair, some hair, lots of hair, brown hair, no eyebrows, lots of eyebrows. You're going to describe the face, but that is not what the Hebrew word face means. Panim means that which is on the inside that shines on the outside. 
Face is your character. Anybody ever heard of the concept two-faced? What do you think it means? He has two real faces? No, it's that his character is split. He talks out of one side and talks out of the other side. The Bible says that, that man's ways are what? Unstable. He has no idea where he's going. So Yahweh wants to see our character. He will look right into your eyes. He will look right into your face. He wants to know who you are from the inside. So anyway, they would go up to the ramp, and they would come to the ramp, and they would turn to the east, towards the Holy of Holies. That's the, okay, they would turn towards the, uh, to the left. When they turn towards the left, we'll give close up here, zoom in, and you can see that there were two silver pots on the edge of the altar. One was for the daily sacrifice. After the daily sacrifice, they would put wine into that. And the other one was only used for this time of year during the Feast of Sukkot. Once a day, they would take water and they would pour it into that pot. Okay? And what happened was those two pots had, had regulators on them. Uh, pretty interesting, simple technology is that water is thinner than wine, isn't it? So they wanted the water and the wine to end up at the base of the altar at the exact same time. So what they did was they made the, the hole at the base of the water pot smaller than the one on the wine so that it would regulate and literally the drops would hit the base of the altar at the exact same time. They would go down into little grooves, the water and the blood would run down, and it would hit the base of the altar at the same time. Now, what's so amazing, here's a, a larger picture from the ground of what it looks like, and you see on the left there a 30-foot willow tree. They would cut down these giant willow trees Okay, have the, another, while one uh, 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 priestly course is doing this service, another priestly course is going down and they're cutting down these 30 foot willow trees and they're having this giant parade on the way back to Jerusalem, uh, like willow branches, uh, uh, waving in the wind, the ruach, and they're bringing in the spirit while another course is bringing in the water and the blood. Hello? The Spirit and the blood together with the Ruach HaKodesh coming in and blowing into Jerusalem on this day. Wow, is right. Let's go to John chapter 19, verse 30. You're going to figure out exactly what this is all about. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished to tell us I. And he bowed his head and gave up his ghost. And four verses later, the very thing after the harvest, after everything's done, at the end of the year, Yeshua said, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and what came out? Blood and water. He is the water libation ceremony. He is all about this ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, because when it's finished, it is finished with his blood and his water. He, that's, that, if we think that that soldier was mean, he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He had to hit his side because, the, because it ain't finished until the water and the blood pour out together and hit the base of the altar and do you know it doesn't have to be the actual altar clearly it wasn't because the Bible says that the earth is his altar John 7 37 in the last day the great day of the feast if you know anything about God's calendar you know exactly what we're talking about this is the feast of Sukkot Yeshua is here, and we know exactly even what day it is. It's the seventh day, because it's called the great day of the feast. Yeshua stood and cried out. You know what happens before I go to this? Once a day, they would take the water out from the pool of Siloam, from the below. They would circle the altar one time, and then they would pour it out. How many times did they do that? One, that's right, seven times. So on the seventh day... One time for each millennium. On the seventh day, they did it seven times in connection with the city of Jericho and its walls came down. At the end of time, when the Messiah comes back, by the way, what is seven times seven? Forty-nine. Do you know what happens on the 50th day? It's the year of Jubilee. It's not just a Shemitah year, it's a Yovel. It is the year, the fifth, every 50 years is a Jubilee and all of your debts are washed away. 
This is the seventh day of the feast on the seventh month. This is the, the seventh time that they have done this. They're going to do it seven more times for the 70 nations with the 70 elders. How many more 70s can I think of? And this great feast, Yeshua stands up and says this while they're pouring the water on the altar during this incredible water feast. He says that if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What came out of his belly just not too long after this? Living water. Water and blood. And 50 days later, the willow tree blew in heaven and the Ruach HaKodesh came down and filled your temple. This is why you have to have the blood and be baptized in fire and in water. Because you must have the blood of the Ruach HaKodesh on you and you must have the spirit of the living God as well. It is not enough, ladies and gentlemen, to say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in His blood. You must have the willow branches as part of that ceremony. You must breathe in the Ruach. You must breathe in His Spirit and have that living water that flows out from you. And did you know today the Gihon Spring, located right there in the Temple Mount, flows and gushes out from underneath the Temple Mount today just as a living representative that I am still here. My Spirit, my water I'm going to show you in a physical realm my water still flows from Jerusalem. Just look east to see those lights. Oh, it gets better. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 12. If we would not be so blind, we would see so many things. And I, I say that in the context of 2,000 years ago, how they missed this, because this is the chapter that they read and sang during the Feast of Sukkot, during the water libation ceremony, let me read it to you. It says this, Then you will say on that day, this is this day, this is the day right here in John chapter 7 when Yeshua stands up, this is the prophesied day right here in Isaiah chapter 12 that they're talking about. Remember that. It says, Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away. You comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joylessly draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitants of Sion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Now let me read it the way it should have been read and you'll see why Yeshua stood up when he says this in verse 2. Behold, Elohim is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and song. He has become my Yeshua. Therefore you will joyously draw water from the springs of Yeshua. They're singing Yeshua's name as he stands in the same place. They're singing this. Praise the Lord, we will joyously draw water from the springs of this guy right here. As Yeshua stands up and says, by the way, I'm that guy you keep talking about. If you thirst, come to me and you will never be thirsty again. And some in their midst, the light bulb got turned on. Ladies and gentlemen, on the seventh day, it's called Hoshana Rabbah, the seventh day, the Sabbath. Look at the things that are connected to it. Jericho, the walls come down, the millennial reign of the Messiah, all on the seventh day. This is why everything culminated to the grand finale of Sukkot on the seventh day. And then there was one more day, totally separate from the rest, called Shemini Etzeret, the eighth day. It's a high Sabbath. It's a new beginning. The number eight in Hebrew means a new beginning. Go figure. Coincidence, I'm sure. 
And it was also Simchat Torah when the Torah started over. The seventh millennium, the thousand year reign of our, our Christ, our Messiah, is connected to Hoshana Rabbah. Save us, our Lord. Blessed be your name. It is connected to the millennial reign of the Messiah when the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, will blow through the world and nothing will stop it this time. The blood and the water will flow through your veins so thick that you will have life eternal. Because you know why? The life is in the blood. And when your blood is not mixed with the Messiah's, and it's only the Messiah's blood that runs through your heavenly body, you will have new life eternal. And my challenge to you this evening is this, not that we just learn the details of Sukkot and go, wow, isn't that neat? But that you understand that you are a living tabernacle of praise. Let me ask you a question. This is all a dress rehearsal. Have you even started preparing? And are you ready? Because the time of Sukkot is coming where you will or will not be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I hope that in my life that I am so prepared that He would dare to consider me a bride and not just a wedding guest. I will be thrilled to be there if I am not righteous enough there are two righteousness, ladies and gentlemen. There is the righteousness of Yeshua that allows me to live with Him eternally. But there is another righteousness that the Bible talks about. And it says that those who love Him keep His commandments. It is that which I am judged by once I'm in the gate. And it is that righteousness, meaning that I keep my Abba's commandments. I do what my Father says to do the best that I can. I know I'm broken. I will never. Do you know you can't keep the Torah? It's not possible. But there's nowhere in the Bible that says don't try. It's quite the opposite. It says you better try because he who teaches that the law of God is done away with will be least in my kingdom. Matthew 7, 21. I don't want to be least. I want to sit at my king's table. And it begins with humbling ourselves and recognizing that we need mercy and grace for our ignorance and our lack of obedience to honor His calendar, and we've placed our calendar over His. I encourage you this day to check your heart, check your mind, your will, your emotions, shakaw, bow before your King, and prepare to meet Him because you will. Let's pray. Thank you, Father for your holy word. Your word is great, and it is greatly to be praised. Father, it is through your word that you convict us. It is through your word that you encourage us. It is through your word that you wrap your arms around us, and you say, I will be your sukkah. I will be your strong tower. Father, would you take this last and great day and would you teach us how to pour ourselves out like your son poured himself out? Let us die so that we might live. Let us stop living among the nations and live among your people. Abba, thank you for your heart, your love. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Father that you care enough about us to give us physical instruments and hints of how to come closer to you. Thank you for your word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be lifted upon you. May he have grace upon you. And may he give you shalom. Amen and amen. Amen.